Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, if any one of us could just start with a word of prayer and commit this class into the Lord's hands, then we can begin. And even if anyone online would like to pray, that's also fine. All right, then let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. We pray, oh Lord, that uh, you would prepare our hearts for the things that we want to reflect upon. And we pray, oh Lord, that you would directly communicate with each one of us, imparting to us the lessons which we specifically need for our own lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. So, all right, then um, let's begin with our class on First Kings. So last class, we looked at 2 Samuel, uh, and now we are moving into the book of Kings. So just like the book of Samuel was also one single volume, uh, even the book of Kings was also one single volume when it was originally written in the Hebrew language. Uh, but then when they were doing the translation into the Greek language, it was not possible to fit the entire uh, um, writing into one single scroll. So it was during the translation work into Greek that they split it into two books. So it became First Kings and Second Kings. And um, uh, so that is the format in which we find it in the Greek Septuagint. All right. So uh, those who are, who are making a noise, if you can all just settle down and be quiet, you know, then um, the focus will be better. So yes, let's look a little bit into the compilation of this book of Kings. It contains the history of 400 years of the um, rule of the different kings. So it covers a period of 400 years, which basically means that one single person could not have you know, sat and written uh, the entire book of Kings. So um, it's generally understood that someone would have taken the different written records and then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they would have chosen which portions should be included in the uh, you know, book of Kings and which portions should not be included. So those decisions would have been taken sometime during those 400 years. Um, in the book of Kings itself, you have various uh, royal records mentioned, you know, because in the royal court, it was generally the practice that they would maintain written records of the different things which are taking place, uh, you know, the conquests of the kings, the main events during the time of the uh, of the kingdom, and all of those details. So, in fact, we see some of those royal records mentioned in the Book of Kings. For instance, in First Kings chapter eleven, verse forty-one, it talks about the book of the annals of Solomon, and then in First Kings fourteen nineteen. It refers to the annals of the kings of Israel. And then in 1429, uh, there's something called the annals of the kings of Judah. So these are all written records which were in existence in the royal court at that time. And it is uh, believed that generally, probably during the time of King Josiah, at that time, maybe the scribes who were there at that time, began to bring together the main things which are there in these records. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they would have decided which ones should be included finally in the, in the Book of Kings and what should not be included. So the Book of Kings probably would have reached its more or less final form during the reign of King Josiah. But the actual finalization and compilation happens only after Israel, after the people go into exile. Why do we say that? Because when we look at 2 Kings, it ends with a story of uh, King Jehoiakim, who has been taken as a, a slave along with all the people to Babylon. And then the king of Babylon shows him kindness and you know sets him free from the prison. So an event which took place after the exile started is mentioned, which means that even though most of the book probably was compiled in the time of King Josiah, 
the final co compilation would have taken place during the time of the exile when the people are actually living in babylon so scribes in the time of babylon uh, you know who are, when they are living over there in exile at that time they would have finalized and included some final details which should be there and then closed the book so we see that the holy spirit would have worked through different people to make this happen okay so um this is regarding the formation of the book of kings uh what is the book of kings actually talk about it's it's mainly a history of the various kings you know like the title itself suggests it's a history of the kings focusing mainly on the good influences which they had and also the negative influences which they had so there are some kings who did much for yahweh and for the kingdom and there are other kings who only served themselves and in fact brought harm to the name of yahweh and in fact the interests of the kingdom so we see a record of these different kings um and what they did how they impacted the people of god uh so if we were to look at the structure first kings chapter 1 to 11 uh focuses upon solomon how he rose up how he ruled and also how he fell you know so all these things would be found in first kings chapters 1 to 11 and then when we move into first kings chapter 12 up to chapter 14 that is where you have a description of how the kingdom got divided into two portions God himself divides the kingdom into two portions because he's very very displeased with Solomon and his conduct. So the division of the kingdom is discussed in 1 Kings chapter 12 up to chapter 14 and then chapter 15 to chapter 17 is where you have a uh, you know um the list of uh, the kings of Israel and how they you know uh, how they lived uh, and um, also how finally the kingdom of israel was you know completely defeated so you will find a description of that in first kings chapter 15 all the way up to second kings chapter 17 so first kings 15 all the way up to second kings chapter 17 you have a list of the uh, israelite kings and um the ultimate fall of the kingdom of israel and then as for the kingdom of juda that uh, that description and its downfall is mentioned in second kings chapters 18 to 25 so this would be a general structure of this particular book of solomon i mean of the book of kings so now we will get into the you know um, look very briefly at some highlights in solomon's life first thing that we notice about solomon in his early years is that he is very conscious of the fact that god has appointed him to be his human representative he is not just uh, been made king to enjoy himself he has been appointed as king to serve as god's human representative and he is very very careful about that role of his in the initial years so when god comes to him in a dream and asks him what do you want he does not ask for power he does not ask for military might what he asks for is he asks for wisdom he says lord i'm like a child i don't even know how to rule your people in the correct manner but i want to do it correctly because he understands that he is yahweh's representative and so he asks the lord for wisdom to be able to rule in the correct manner and the lord is pleased i know for his uh, because of his heart and the lord says e because you know you you went after the correct things and you actually wanted good uh, for the nation therefore i will not only give you wisdom i will also give you wealth and honor so uh, it is in first uh, kings chapter 8 verse 60 that we see this uh, yeah someone could read out first kings chapter 8 verse 60 please that all the peoples of the earth may know that the lord is god there is no other this was the desire of solomon that all the peoples of the earth should know that yahweh is the living god the way yahweh is ruling this particular nation it should set an example to everyone and show them that here in this nation is the living god not in the other places but here 
among this people is the living god so with that desire he starts off his rule and the lord uh, just as the lord promised he makes him uh, one of the wealthiest persons and one of the most honored persons of his time that would be in first uh, kings chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 where we are told that he had more wealth and more honor than any other king of his time and then in the next chapter first uh, kings chapter 4 verses 20 to 21 we get to know that all the other nations paid him tribute so they were all under his control imagine he never fought a single battle in his entire life his, his father fought battles and conquered but he was given a time of peace the lord promises and says you will not have to fight any battles but you will be the most powerful so it's literally god's hand upon him you know and his kingdom where even without fighting a single battle or proving his military might he is able to get tribute from all the other nations who pay up you know every year they pay up gold and silver and uh, the other things which they are supposed to as his tributes as his vassals so he's placed in this position of great authority and influence by god because he said that he wants wisdom to make yahweh known to all the peoples of the earth because he has this noble goal in his heart the lord places him at the highest level and um, when we are reflecting upon the life of uh, solomon maybe this one verse which we can look at from the book of proverbs this is not a proverb written by solomon uh, this particular proverb was written by another person but there's such a important thought in this particular you know a uh, proverb so if you could turn with me to proverbs chapter 30 and if someone could read out for us verses 7 to 9 look at the significance of what this man is praying for in these verses proverbs 30 verses 7 to 9 please two things i request of you remove the remove falsehood and lies far from me give me neither poverty nor riches feed me with the food allotted to me uh, let lest i be full and deny you deny you and say who is the lord or lest i be poor and settle and profane the name of my god this is probably a good prayer which maybe all of us should learn to pray for our own lives this man this very wise man this is the prayer he says he does not say lord make me the more richest person on earth he doesn't pray lord make me the most influential and powerful person on earth he says let me be rich enough where you know i will have all my needs met but don't let me become so rich that i will no longer be dependent upon you you know where i'll become arrogant and think that i don't need your help anymore because now i have everything i need such a wise prayer generally what people would pray is make me the most powerful make me the richest but here is a such a wise man he understands the limitations of his humanness and you know and this temptation that is there within us to fall into sin so he prays this wise prayer and he says make me uh, rich enough that i'll have all my needs met but lord don't let me become rich so rich that i'll no longer feel my dependence upon you and uh, he also says don't let me be so poor that you know i'll be tempted to steal and do uh, Ill, uh, wrong sinful things to get what i require for my daily bread so it's a, such a wise prayer which this man prays and we see solomon when he was placed in a position where he's the richest and most honored and most powerful he forgets that he is dependent on yahweh he's nothing without yahweh's help but he forgets his dependency and this one proverb which solomon himself you know writes we don't know whether he wrote this before his fall or whether he wrote it in his last days after his fall but you know in proverbs 16 18 he himself writes and he says pride goes before destruction a haughty spirit before a fall and so once he is established by yahweh 
he forgets how uh, he, he forgets his dependency on yahweh he forgets his loyalty towards yahweh and he allows his heart to become more and more proud and self dependent so which is why now it's easier for him to just go and marry whomever he wants because he no longer feels that need to be under the shelter and covering of yahweh so he begins to marry whomever he wants to because he feels that if he has enough political alliances you know in those days a political alliance is formed through marriage so the king uh, approaches the king of another nation and he offers to marry one of the you know princesses of that kingdom so that there is a political partnership formed between this kingdom and that kingdom god established him and placed him in power there was no need for him to go and make alliances and partnerships with with pagan nations why did he feel insecure why did he feel that he has to make partnerships with pagan kingdoms to strengthen his position it's crazy because the lord promised him he said that you will have a time of peace and you will be the most powerful you will be the most wealthy so it is such foolishness that rather than trusting in the living god who has given his word he felt the need to go and make this political alliances with pagan nations and those pagan wives led him into idol worship and this is the lord's response when the lord sees uh, you know the way this man has um, exploited all the privileges which the lord gave him so this is what the lord says against him um, if we could just have uh, someone read out two verses first kings chapter 11 read out verse 11 and also verse 13 so in first kings chapter 11 if you could read out verse 11 and verse 13 please therefore the lord said to solomon because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes uh, which i have commanded you i will surely surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant verse 13 however i will not tear away the whole kingdom i will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant david and for the sake of jerusalem which i have chosen so the lord says i gave you everything that you could possibly need uh, but you have not honored me so i will take away what i gave you i will not take it away in your lifetime because you know i i, I um, because i want to honor your father david so i will not make it happen in your lifetime but it will happen in the lifetime of your son where you will no longer have this kingdom which you know i literally just handed over to you you never had to fight a single battle it was all just given to you on a platter but you have not appreciated the privilege which was given to you so the lord says 10 of the tribes will no longer be under you you will only have juda you know because they are they are judahites uh, david and his family are all judahites so juda will remain with you and benjamin also will remain with you and uh, in some places in the bible juda and benjamin are almost considered like one single tribe that's because the benjamites were very small in population they were a very small number so they were not a very significant tribe so juda and benjamin tends to get combined and in some places it's almost considered as one single tribe uh, so the lord says this one uh, tribe will remain under you but all the other 10 tribes i will take away from your hands and the lord says i will give it to one of your subordinates it's what the lord says and because of that during the time of uh, solomon's son rehoboam we see the kingdom being split into two So when we talk about the kingdom of Israel we are talking about the northern kingdom and so the northern kingdom of Israel consists of 10 tribes they have their uh, they had their capital at Samaria Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom and then um, as for the southern kingdom the southern kingdom only consisted of Judah and Benjamin and for them their capital was obviously Jerusalem you know where you have the ark of the a uh, covenant resting so this is how um, the nation got divided into two uh, it was a judgment which god brought upon solomon 
and uh, so whom did god give the 10 tribes to because the lord said i will give it to one of your subordinates so who is the person who gets it uh, we we see that jeroboam is the one who is given this uh, and we see the details in first kings chapter 11 verses 27 to 33 so when we go to first kings chapter 11 we see that uh, solomon instead of you know ruling the people wisely the way he promised yahweh he would in the beginning now he's only serving himself he's very busy with architectural projects he's making his um, his um, capital city very beautiful he's building uh, terraces and gardens and what not uh, this is basically what the man is doing with all the money and the wealth which god gave him rather than using it to serve the people forget about serving the people now he's putting heavy taxes on them because the money is now no longer enough he's the wealthiest man and the money is not enough because now he has all kinds of self serving projects in mind so he begins to tax the people very heavily so that he can collect more money and make himself even more grand so that the whole the world will say oh what a wonderful king he is so it's very sad he falls so low from god's standard of being yahweh's representative so those of us who are in ministry we need to take these lessons to heart especially if we are in ministry that word ministry is talking about ministering we minister to the lord by serving his people in different capacities it's all about ministering to him to yahweh we are not in ministry to build up our own little kingdoms so when someone falls the way solomon did it displeases the lord a lot that now we are serving ourselves rather than serving him so it's a lesson that you know we need to take seriously to heart and so um when solomon is doing all of these building projects he finds that one one official of his a young man is really good at his job a person named jeroboam and so he places jeroboam in charge of his entire uh, labor force uh, you know um, from the different tribes of joseph so he places this jeroboam as the head of the entire labor force which is working for him in all of these building projects and so jeroboam is basically going about his work one day he's basically going to another place he's going towards jerusalem and while he is going to jerusalem he is approached by a prophet named ahija and the prophet tells him very frankly 10 of the tribes will be given to you only two tribes will be, will be left in the hands of solomon uh, and so this is god's promise to you and this prophet goes on to say uh, very nice things to him um but first let's look at the reason which um the prophet gives about why the 10 tribes are being taken away from solomon so maybe first kings chapter 11 we will look at verse 33 and then we will go on to look at some of the beautiful promises which god makes to uh, jeroboam uh, but first uh, we will look at first kings chapter 11 verse 33 if someone could read out because they have forsaken me and worship astronaut and the godness of the sidonites chimoch the god of moabites and milcom the god of the people of ammon and how not work in my ways to what he is right my eyes and kept my stat, 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 statutes and my judgment as did his father david so the lord explains to jeroboam why he is giving him 10 tribes it is because solomon made a very very horrible mistake he was unfaithful to yahweh and he began to worship the goddess of the sidonians he began to worship the god of the moabites he began to follow after the god of the ammonites and so very very clearly the first thing which is told to jeroboam is that the lord does not approve of betrayal if you stop worshiping yahweh and you go and worship other gods the lord is not pleased with it so the lord explains very clearly why he is giving these 10 tribes to jeroboam so that jeroboam will not be like solomon rather jeroboam will be a 
true representative of Yahweh, you know, in his kingship. So the Lord makes that very clear to him. And then this is what the Lord promises to this person. So if you were to uh, maybe read out 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 37 to 39. So I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart's desires and you shall be king over Israel. Then I did shall be if you hate all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did. Then I will be with you and build, build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you and I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. So when the Lord speaks to David and then Solomon, and he speaks over here to Jeroboam, wherever he says, I will build you a house, it's not talking about a house building project. He's talking about how he will establish his dynasty, how he will establish his empire, his kingdom. So here the Lord is saying to Jeroboam, you know, you will rule over all that your heart desires. In no way will you lack. Whatever you desire, you will be able to achieve it. You will be a successful, powerful king. This is a promise which the Lord is making to Jeroboam, saying that you will rule all that your heart desires. And also the Lord says to him, I will be with you. And the Lord says to him, I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. So in the same way I built a dynasty for David and promised that his kings will always be on the throne, I'm willing to do the same thing for you. Your dynasty also will be equally powerful. In no way will your dynasty be inferior to David's dynasty. This is the promise which the Lord made to this person. And all that the Lord asked in return is that he should follow the ways of the Lord. And um, then when finally, uh, so yeah, when, when Solomon gets to know about this, he actually tries to kill Jeroboam. We see that in that same chapter. You know, it reminds us of, uh, reminds us of somebody else who was busy trying to kill the anointed king. So it's very sad. I mean, the same way Saul was trying to kill David, now Solomon tries to kill Jeroboam. The same ugly story is repeating itself, you know, because Solomon has now forgotten the Lord. Uh, so he probably comes back to the Lord in his old age, you know, repents of his foolishness. Um, but yeah, many of, of his years are lost in the process. So finally, Jeroboam comes, you know, to the position of power. And um, so after Jeroboam has been established as king over the ten tribes, you know, and what God has promised to him has now come true. He notices that people are still going to Jerusalem from the 10 tribes. The people are going to Jerusalem, to the other kingdom, to offer their sacrifices at the temple. Because that's basically what the Lord said, you know, everyone has to come to the temple in Jerusalem to make their sacrifices to Yahweh. So he begins to think, hmm, these people are still having connections to the other kingdom. Every year, they're going to keep going over there to Jerusalem. As long as these emotional ties are there between them and this other kingdom, my position is at risk. But what did the Lord say? The Lord said, you will rule over everything your heart desires. The Lord said, I will build you a dynasty which is equal to, da to David's. And yet, this man is insecure in his heart. And he thinks, I should somehow stop these people from the ten tribes you know, from going over there to the other kingdom. I should cut off contact with the other kingdom completely. And so, a man who knows exactly why the kingdom was taken away from Solomon, a man who knows that God is against idol worship, he basically does this. Um, so maybe we could look at First Kings chapter 12, uh, verses 28 to 30. Yeah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two cloths of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to the Jerusalem. Here are two, uh, your gods, O Israel, which brought up you from the land of Egypt. And he said, Up one in the Bethel, and other put in the den. Uh, now, he, 
Now these things become a sin for the people went to the worship before one as far as then. All right. So here we see that after consulting with people, you know, he must have consulted the really wrong people. This is the plan that he comes up with. He says he makes two golden calves. And he says to the people, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Doesn't quite make sense, right? I mean, as far as we know, two golden calves did not bring the people out of Egypt. The two golden calves did not divide the Red Sea into two halves. So what is he trying to say over here? I mean, are the people so foolish that they'll believe him? No, basically it's like this. Um, in the ancient times, in fact, even in our Indian culture, you know, these animals and birds are considered vehicles of the idol that is being worshipped. So here in our, you know, Indian culture, we are familiar with the tiger. You have a particular idol which sits on the tiger. And you have, uh, you know, um, so this kind of imagery. So basically what is Jeroboam telling the people here? These two golden calves, they are like a representation of Yahweh. I'm not asking you to go after any new religion. Yes, we are still followers of Yahweh, but you will be worshipping Yahweh in a slightly different manner. Now onwards, these two golden calves, they are going to represent Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt. So you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem to do your worship over there. You can go ahead and do your worship here. So he puts one of the calves, uh, golden calves in Bethel and he puts the other one in Dan and it encourages the people to start doing their worship here itself. So it's no longer the true worship of Yahweh. There's a mixture along with some pagan heathen elements, you know, which we see happen. We, have, we see it uh, having happened even in Christianity, where you had other variations coming up. Idol worship was introduced into Christianity. But if you ask the people who follow those, uh, you know, uh, customs, they will say, no, 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 we all worship Jesus. But they use idolatry to worship Jesus. And, you know, that is not something which uh, the Bible, uh, you know, ever encourages. So we see this happening. And we have given more details about what else Jeroboam did. It says in verse 31 that he built shrines on high places. Uh, so he built many, many temples all over his kingdom. So that people will feel very happy and satisfied to do all their worship here itself. And nobody will feel the urge to go to Jerusalem. Um, it also says that he appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. So uh, now the priesthood can include people from any tribe. And obviously they will have to be loyal to the golden calves rather than loyal to Yahweh. Uh, so he does that. And he also institutes a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, it says. So, you know, at festival time, people may get very sentimental and they may, may want to go to, you know, Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the Lord. So he again invents a different festival, which they can do over here itself, so that they will not feel the urge to go to the other kingdom. And so he's doing all of this to protect himself you know, because what is his fear? This is what he's so afraid of, even though God promised him, you know, a dynasty. This is what he's afraid of. First Kings chapter 12, verse 27, if someone could read out. First Kings 12, 27. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the hearts of these people will turn back to their Lord. Rehovah, Rehovah Bam, king of Jew. Judah, and they will kill me and go back to the Rehoboam, king of Judah. He says to himself, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. What a silly thing to say. God has said that he will establish him. But he's scared that the, the people will kill him and go back to Jerusalem. So you see the, the lies which Satan has put into his mind. And he believes those lies more than he believes the promise of Yahweh, the living God. So that is how Satan, you know, takes us away from the paths of the Lord. He puts lies in our minds and he says, yeah, yeah, God has said all kinds of things in the Bible. Do you really believe all that? I think this is what is going to happen to you if you don't make some compromise. So Satan puts lies in our minds 
which sound more real to our human fleshly ears than the actual promises of Yahweh. But if Jeroboam had stuck with the Lord, just as the Lord promised, he would have made Jeroboam's dynasty equal with David's dynasty. But, you know, Jeroboam in his foolishness leads the people into sin. And in fact, it says over here in 1 uh, first, first Kings chapter 12, verse 30, and, you know, what Jeroboam did with the golden calves, it says this became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. So he literally leads an entire uh, kingdom into idolatry. Because of him, the northern kingdom never recovers. Um, you know, if we were to go on to see, uh, if, you, if you look at the entire history of the northern kingdom, uh, basically they lasted only about 200 years and they had 19 kings. So the northern king basically had 19 kings over a period of 200 years. Not one single of the one of them was a follower of Yahweh. All of them were idol worshippers because of what Jeroboam did. And if you look at the history of those 19 kings in the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, this wording is used again and again. They followed the ways of Jeroboam who had led them into sin. That same line is repeated again and again for each of those kings. What Jeroboam did had long lasting impact. So, you know, my personal greed, my insecurity in God, my selfishness can affect future generations and destroy God's purposes. What, what heights of foolishness we see over here in the action of Jeroboam. So because of him, those 19 kings who come after him, not one of them is a follower of Yahweh. So that's the tragedy which we see. And uh, so in 1 Kings chapter 13, you know, Jeroboam has now built an altar at Bethel and is about to make a grand offering over there to the golden calf. And when he's about to do that, there's this prophet who comes and the prophet cries out and makes a prophecy against uh, Jeroboam. Maybe we could read out that. 1 Kings chapter 13, uh, verse 2. Yeah. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Joshua by name, he shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high places, who burn incense on you, and the man born shall be born on you. So the prophet cries out and makes a judgment against Jeroboam and says, you know what? This altar which you have now built and which you are now going to be using to worship this golden calf, this is what is going to happen in the future. One day from the, you know, uh, Judah, in the, from the line of Judah, a person named Josiah will be born and he will destroy this altar which you have built. And in fact, he will desecrate this altar by burning human bones on it, is what the prophet says. And we see this particular prophecy being fulfilled in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 14 to 16. So in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 14 to 16, Josiah has come to power in Judah and he loves the Lord. He wants to cleanse the land of all idolatry. So basically, he's going from place to place, destroying all the you know uh, temples of false worship. And so he comes even to Bethel. And so in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 15, we are told that even the altar at Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Naboth, who had caused Israel to sin, even that altar and high place he demolished. So just as the prophet had proclaimed, um, Josiah destroys this altar which Jeroboam constructed. He came over there to destroy the altar. He didn't have any plans of desecrating it with human bones. But then he, he's just looking around and he happens to see some tombs nearby. So he asks, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, whom do these tombs belong to? And he gets to know that these are the tombs of the um, of the priests of the false gods. 
so then he goes to the tombs he takes the bones which are there in those tombs you know of the false priests and he brings them to the altar and he burns those bones on the altar to desecrate it so every word of prophecy which was spoken long ago it is fulfilled exactly the way the prophet you know uh, has prophesied so we see um, the northern kingdom going into sin all the 19 rulers who come after jeroboam they are all sinful just like jeroboam because jeroboam introduced them to this idol worship jeroboam built those two golden calves which made the people sin and uh, so the lord's anger is finally released against uh, the northern kingdom um and uh, so finally in 723 bc that's basically when the assyrians they come and they conquer the northern kingdom they take away the people from the 10 tribes you know and uh, to assyria and to and put them in all the other places and so uh, the northern kingdom of israel is wiped out uh, most of the people living over there are taken away as slaves to assyria and to all the other places so that is the end of the northern kingdom what happens to the southern kingdom the southern kingdom has a few godly kings so it manages to last longer whereas the northern kingdom was able to survive only 200 years the southern kingdom lasts about 350 years so it you know it, it's able to last a little longer and the southern kingdom has got 20 kings out of these 20 kings only 8 of them actually walk in the ways of god if you do the math it's quite sad out of 20 kings of uh, of the house of david only 8 actually follow the ways of yahweh and out of those eight only two of them perform so well that you know the lord praises them and says yes you are really walking the way david did so it's a very very sad thing that we see over here and so the two kings who in fact are you know complimented by the lord are hezekiah and josiah except for hezekiah and josiah all the other kings are very half hearted in their service of yahweh and in fact only eight of them are actually true followers of yahweh at all uh, you know the rest of them uh, continue in idolatry just like the kings of the northern kingdom so finally the lord brings judgment even upon the southern kingdom whereas the northern kingdom was taken over by assyria the southern kingdom is taken over by the babylonians so the babylonians they come and they defeat the southern kingdom and they take away the people who are here into exile to babylon so if you call yourself a student of the bible at least you should be knowing these basic facts that during the time of rehoboam the son of solomon the kingdom got divided into two parts so the southern kingdom came under rehoboam the northern kingdom came under jeroboam you would need to know which is the capital city of each of these northern kingdom and southern kingdoms who had their capital where you would also need to know finally when god brought judgment upon these two kingdoms who conquered them who conquered the northern kingdom who conquered the southern kingdom so these are some basic things which you would need to know at least you know regarding the history of um, the monarchy in uh, the time of israel now how about uh, how about things between the, the northern and the southern kingdoms um we see that most of the time they kept to themselves um on some occasions you know the northern kingdom tried to fight a battle against the southern kingdom but god very strictly warned and said if you start fighting with your own brothers you know there will be a great judgment which will come on your heads the lord could not tolerate that so to an ex- to a great extent the northern kingdom and the southern king- kingdom kept to themselves they did not interfere with the other kingdom or try to kill the you know people of the other kingdom um you have one person jehoshaphat who in his foolishness makes a alliance with the northern kingdom so jehoshaphat is in fact a godly king is in fact a good king who loved the lord but he made the really momentous foolish stupid decision of forming an alliance with the northern kingdom especially when the northern king at that time was ahab one of the most evil men 
I do not know in what way Satan deceived him and tricked his mind so that he was willing to do something so foolish. So a man who's actually godly, God-fearing, the king of, uh, king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, he chooses to make a marriage alliance with the northern kingdom where Ahab is the king at that particular point of time. Ahab, you see, has chosen to marry Jezebel, uh, who is from another nation. So he has become a completely total idol worshipper. In fact, he has no problem with even human sacrifices. You know, he's gone to that stage. He's that kind of a person. So Jehoshaphat, the godly king, chooses to make a partnership with Ahab, a highly evil king. And he says, I will give my son in marriage to your daughter. Now, that daughter is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So you can imagine how she has turned out, in what kind of an atmosphere she has grown up. A woman like that, he goes and gives his son in marriage to Athaliah. And Athaliah, later on, you get to know she's a mass murderer. I mean, that woman is shockingly terrible. So Jehoshaphat is somehow induced by Satan into doing this very terrible thing where he forms a partnership with the northern kingdom. So that is basically how these two kingdoms kind of get connected through marriage to some extent. And um, um, we see that Ahab actually tricks Jehoshaphat into going into battle with him. And he says, you know, when we go into battle together, um, you go dressed in your, you know, in your royal Judah robes. On the other hand, I'll go disguised as a common soldier. His idea is that when Jehoshaphat goes over there into battle along with him, you know, the enemy should think that he's the king and they should kill him. And, you know, Ahab should escape uh, with his life. So, in fact, it's only sheer mercy of God that Jeho uh, Jehoshaphat is able to come out of that, you know, encounter alive. So, uh, when uh, Jehoshaphat comes back from the battle safe, of course, Ahab dies in that battle because that's what the Lord had decreed. This is what the Lord says uh, through his prophet, uh, you know, um, um, would that would be in... First Kings, Second Chronicles, I think is basically where it would be mentioned. Yeah, because Kings does not talk about this particular thing. But, you know, a prophet comes to Jehoshaphat and this is what the prophet says to Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 19 verses 1 to 3. The prophet says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. So Jehoshaphat he chose to make a partnership with the wicked. He chose to love whom the Lord hates. And because of that, the wrath of the Lord came upon him. You know, so it was a highly foolish thing which Jehoshaphat did to enter into a partnership with the wicked. And um, um, because of that, it leads to other complications during his uh, rule. So, um, because we do not have time, we are not going into details. Otherwise, we could have looked at so many more lessons which we can gain out of this um, chapter. Just one thing, you know, when, um, when Ahab says to him, will you come along with me to fight in the battle? And he says, my people are like your people. Yes, I will partner with you. I'll give my full support. And then, of course, you know, we see that Ahab very cleverly, he disguises himself as a common soldier, whereas he asks Jehoshaphat to wear his royal robes so that he'll get targeted. But one thing Jehoshaphat says at that time, his first immediate response when Nahab makes the request, he says, let's first consult the prophet of God. Because, you know, he's been living in Judah. At least he has some godly ways in his heart. And so he first wants to consult God before going into battle. And Ahab says, okay, fine, you want to consult God? I'll bring my prophets. You know how these prophets are, right? They've been happily worshipping the golden calves. So they are not true prophets. So right from the beginning of that partnership, we see the struggle. Jehoshaphat wants to do God's ways. Ahab, on the other hand, couldn't care less about God's ways. So in fact, this brings out how impossible it is for the people of the light to partner with the people of darkness, which is basically why a marriage between a believer and a non-believer can never really work. Because from day one, the godly spouse will want to do things Yahweh's way. The ungodly spouse, on the other hand, just want to take decisions according to their wisdom. It just doesn't work. It does not work. Okay, so yeah, let's just close with a word of prayer.
Lord, there are only some lessons that we could learn today from uh, the book of First Sam, uh, First Kings. But Lord, we pray that you would impress these spiritual principles on our hearts, so that when Lord, when we are making our own decisions for our life and for our ministry, we will honor you. We will do things in a way which please you and in a way which uh, which is wise, rather than being tricked by Satan. Oh Lord, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen.